All right, guys. So tonight, we're going to talk about tax loss harvesting. You guys have probably heard this uh, term used quite a bit this year in particular because it has to do with investments being um, lower than typical, right? When you have a loss, a, a uh, paper loss, this strategy comes into play a lot of times. So what exactly is tax loss harvesting before we even get into the details, right? First things first is tax, not investing strategy. This is not a, an investment strategy. You use it for your investments, but one reason I say not investing in particular is because I see a lot of times is people have bad investments and they think it is a great investment strategy just because um, they are doing the lesser of the evils, if that makes sense. So they're turning a bad situation to a less bad situation. It is not a good investment strategy. This, is not, this isn't supposed to be used on the regular, but if you have a bad situation, you can make it less bad, and that's kind of the way I look at it. So this isn't good necessarily how I put it there. But the goal of this tax strategy, of course, is to lower your taxes. Pretty simple, right? But how do you actually go about doing this? So I'm going to talk about the steps in order to do this, and then we're going to get out into um, some more detail of this as a, as a whole. But the summary of like how this works, right? This is only for taxable accounts. So this does not have to do anything with retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, solo 401ks, and things like that has nothing to do when it comes to those accounts because of the way it's treated from a tax perspective. If you buy and sell in a 401k, you aren't getting a tax, um, a, a, you're not having a capital gains tax. Capital gains does not apply to retirement accounts. So this is only for taxable accounts, such as like a brokerage account. That's where you want to focus your efforts in and when it comes to tax loss harvesting. So if you were down big in your 401k, this doesn't apply to them. This is irrelevant. Um, in your IRA, if you don't have a taxable brokerage account, in fact, which you should, uh, it won't it won't matter. So how does this actually work, right? So you're going to sell a security for a loss, essentially, right? So let's just say we have um, a stock and we have we bought it at thirty thousand dollars, all in our cost basis. It drops to twenty five thousand. You have a five thousand dollar capital loss, essentially. So your goal first to to take advantage of this is to sell that for a loss. But let's say in your portfolio you have other things that you're, um, you've done well on and you've also sold those. The very first thing to take advantage of this is to offset versus your gains. So that could be a capital gain of another stock or another index fund or whatever within a taxable brokerage account or total collective. So this isn't just one account. This is actually applying to if you have multiple brokerage accounts or um, a crypto account or basically a non-retirement account of any sort is capital gains being applied to it. The very first thing, this is a key distinction, guys, or a key important piece of this is this must be applied to the same type of capital gains first. So as you can see over here, we have long-term and short-term capital gains. You have to apply the gain that you're or the sorry, the loss that you're selling to the type of gain first, and then secondary to that, you can go to the opposite type of gain. So if you have a long-term capital loss that you're selling, it has to first be netted against long-term capital gains. And then once that's taken care of, assuming you have additional overage, then you can take that to the short-term capital gains. So it must be for the same, same uh, type first. Uh, so once you offset the gains, you have, let's just say, you could net, you could net to zero or whatever that net number is. So let's say you have a $5,000 loss and a $3,000 gain, you have a $2,000 net loss at that point in time. So you have zero capital gains because your gains off or your losses offset your gains. That's zero, but you have an additional two thousand dollars. You would apply that towards your income, and you're able to apply three thousand dollars every single year up towards your income. So if you have a loss, let's just say um, three, three, four thousand dollar loss on top of the offset of you know, let's just say uh, zero net capital gains. You can put three thousand of that four thousand towards your income in the given year. If you make hundred thousand dollars, you can bring that down to ninety-seven thousand dollars through three thousand. But if you have above the three thousand dollar limit, you have to apply the additional loss to future income years. And there is no cap. And I'm not saying that like the fourteen-year-olds. There's no, there's actually no cap to how long you do that from a from a dollar perspective or future years. This is indefinite. Um, so it's not like, hey, only this is available for three years. You can roll this forward for as many years as possible. 
and this is where good tax strategy and planning comes into play, if you understand when and where to apply these things, it could make sense for some people in some situations. So a few things here, guys. Um, let's see where we want to go next. So we talked about the long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains a little bit. I want to get an understanding for you guys to explain to understand the difference between these two. So all this means is long-term is more than one year. Short-term, less than one year. Pretty simple. So if you are in the, um, if you're for, from a from a uh, brokerage standpoint or from a um, income standpoint, right? Zero to eighty-three thousand dollars would be taxed at zero percent. Eighty-three thousand, approximately to five seventeen, would be taxed at fifteen percent. Most people are right here. This is also these ranges are for married filing jointly in particular. That's not single. Single is like forty thousand ish um, to begin with. But most people are going to fall at fifteen percent for long-term capital gains. The other, you know, big dog earners are at twenty percent, um, but that's where it caps out. So zero, fifteen, or twenty. I'd say most of us on this live tonight are probably at fifteen percent. Uh, that's for married filing jointly. Short-term capital gains, which is why I talk about trading being such a bad thing from a tax drag perspective, it's tax your income rate. So if you're taxed at thirty-two percent. That could be a huge tax swing, or even if you're at 24 percent, but you're at 15 from a long-term capital gains perspective, holding that money would give you a nine percent gain versus 24 percent tax versus 15 percent. So that's significant in, in how they're treated from a tax standpoint, um, and it's also very important. So um, I want to jump over here, guys, as far as the debates go. So when, when it comes to tax loss harvesting, sure, it's a, it's a viable strategy. It can make sense to a lot of people. But at the end of the day, a lot of people will just jump to this, a lot of rookie investors, because they want to sound smart and they're like, oh, I can tax loss harvest. But again, this is turning a bad situation to a less bad situation. You don't want to lose money with your investments, right? Um, but the, the, the whole point of this is there's a lot of debates on top of it. Even if you are um, losing money, does it make sense to always do it? Not necessarily. And I'll show you why. So, First things first, I want to show you how you capital or you, you calculate capital gains in a nutshell. So when we talked about long term and short term, right? So you take your sale price. Um, let's say you sell, I don't know, you sold Apple stock for thirty three thousand dollars in total. Um, the lot that, of the stock that you sold. The cost basis is what you bought it for. As simple as that. So let's say you bought it for twenty four thousand, and you sold it for thirty three thousand. I don't know. Make up the number of shares that that would accumulate for. The difference is your capital gain or loss. So if you have a sale price for less than your cost basis, you obviously have a loss and then vice versa if you have a um, sale price greater than your cost basis. The goal with investing is to increase your cost or increase your, your sale price eventually down the road. You don't want to work backwards or lose money. But in short term, um, one, two to five years maybe, you could experience a loss obviously as we talk about all the time. Or if you pick an individual stock, you never know. That could be a loss after 20 years as well. So what are the debates when it comes to tax loss harvesting? There's a few, right? You're not getting rid of tax at all. You're just deferring the taxes. And I'm gonna show you why. If you're not canceling taxes, you're deferring them to later. So although you bring down your tax um, bill now, your cost basis also is gonna change likely, right? So if you decide to sell a loss for, let's just say $20,000, what are you gonna do with that $20,000? You're gonna go buy some, some asset of some type and your cost basis is going to be reset at a lower cost basis of like let's say twenty thousand example. So the gain, let's say you went from twenty four originally cost basis and you went down to twenty, but you still ultimately sold it for thirty three thousand. Well, if you held it with the first cost basis at twenty four, your your gain would be twenty or nine thousand. But if you let it go down to twenty thousand and then you sold it for the same price a couple years from now at thirty three, your cost basis would be thirteen thousand. So ultimately, you have to make up for that, that tax bill. Um, whether it's you pay tax on thirteen thousand or nine thousand, you're still going to pay the bill. It's just pushing, kicking the can down the road in a sense. Which a lot of times with tax strategy, a lot of times it's one of those balancing acts. It's you almost can't get away from everything, but it's a matter of like pushing it down the road, taking it at the optimal time. Work with a professional if you do this. Do not try to DIY this whole game. You're going to get crushed if you try. Um, work with the CPA that's going to teach you and also give you good recommendations as to should I do this or should I, and it might be a financial professional, like an advisor, if you're working with an advisor, a financial coach that will show, first off, does it make sense from a, from a dollar perspective or an investment standpoint, not even a tax perspective, 
an investment standpoint to take advantage of selling a specific security. Um, and if you guys know my style, I'm probably not going to be stop, uh, tax loss harvesting and selling all my index funds by any means. Um, long story there, but we're going to leave that out tonight. So the other thing is a lot of, there was a study done and conducted saying 40% of the factors are totally uncontrollable. So 60% are variable. So a lot of this has to do with tax, tax uh, the percentage of the tax and tax rates. Those can totally change, um, which kind of gets down to point four, not to skip ahead, but your future tax rates, nobody knows that. So if this 0, 15, and 20% jump up to 20%, 30%, 50%, I'm not saying they are, but like if they change, this whole strategy is going to change drastically because the, the tax rates change. Um, so you gotta be careful when it comes to future tax rates, which in fact, you, you don't know. Um, you're gonna need expertise, kind of what I talked about with the CPA or financial advisor with your investments. Don't do this on your own, just don't. Don't waste your time. You can educate yourself to ask the right questions, but don't try to go do this on your own or think you're gonna outsmart because you you watched, uh, you read an article on NerdWallet about it. Uh, the other thing is cash drag. So if you are doing these, these, uh, these moves with tax loss harvesting, you're selling out of the market. You're out of the market. Your time in the market is less as a result, and you could be sitting in cash for quite some time. In fact, I'm gonna show you an exact example that pulls in the wash sale rule and why that's pretty, pretty uh, important when it comes to this conversation. Okay, so let's get into this example, guys. It's kind of an actual real life example of how this would work and why or why, why, why not it would make sense. So let's take John, for example, right? He's gonna buy Apple stock for $25,000. Let's just say like two years ago. Um, he's going to, let's just say that the Apple stock decreases to 21,000 and he decides to sell. So he locks in a fat loss of $4,000 over, let's just however many years. So he's gonna first, this is how he's gonna do the tax loss harvesting. He's gonna offset his $4,000 L against his $1,000 gain of Microsoft. So that's another assumption I make, is he sold Microsoft within his taxable brokerage or brokerages and received a $1,000 gain. So now he has a, um, a $3,000 obviously um, net, right? So he's, he cancels out this 1,000 with a piece of this 4,000 and he has 3,000 remaining and obviously this is an example, this is why I used the numbers, is now he has zero capital gains tax, nothing, because he's x that out or x that out, but he does have the opportunity to put 3,000 of that towards his income. And that's important, because that's what tax loss harvesting is, essentially, this piece of it right here. So he's gonna put $3,000 to his income, it's gonna be a one year type of deal, and he's gonna cancel that. Now the problem is, he now has a new cost basis of $21,000 because his cost basis is not no longer $25,000 because he decided to sell. So when he has a new cost basis of $21,000, this is assuming he's gonna go buy some, some assets, right? There's one problem with that, is the wash sale rule, which is a major issue because this is a, just in, in a nutshell, right? I'm not gonna go into too, too much detail, but basically 30 days before and after of a sale occurs, you cannot buy a substantially identical asset. So if you're sitting on, on cash for let's say 30 at least days or maybe even 60 in a, in a sense, you're sitting and missing the market gains that could potentially be happening. That's a huge cash drag and that's why I say cash drag is costly because you just don't know what the market's gonna do in those 60 days. And I shared a stat the other day on, on Twitter saying um, 10 of the last, of the last 40 years the, the last, or there was 10 days that made up two thirds of the market um, gains, which was insane if you think about it. So 10 out of 10,000 days, two thirds of that was on those 10 days. Good luck trying to guess out of 10,000 days. That's, a, that's basically a lottery ticket. So this, this is important here. So let's just say there's two examples. I'm gonna take you to the bottom right hand uh, corner now. So let's say John, he ends up selling for thirty thousand versus um, the the twenty one thousand, right? So he has a, he has actually a gain. So he had sold thirty thousand dollars, and the cost basis, let's just say, is, is twenty one thousand at that point in time, because he went and bought you know bought new assets or whatever they they gained they gained uh, not, let's say nine thousand, and so his gain here is nine thousand dollars, and he's taxed at fifteen percent. So he thought he was all strategic with his tax strategy, but at the end of the day, he still paid $1,300 plus in taxes 
because he decided to sell at a later date. Versus the other situation, the let's say 25,000 versus 21,000, a $4,000 gain now at this point in time, and a 15% capital gains rate is still applied at $600. So he's paying like double the tax, let's say in that situation. So again, that can be a very confusing topic and a lot of clarification might be needed on that, so feel free to ask me any questions, guys. Um, but in, in short, this is tax loss harvesting, guys. Um, these four steps are kind of the, the bread and butter for what you need to know, but all of the things around it are very important. I wanna leave you guys with one quick tip that could save you a ton of money, like a ton of money. The crypto hack right here. So you guys might have saw me tweet about this today. The crypto hack is huge. Um, right now, the IRS defines crypto as property, um, not a security. So keyword, security versus property. See security? Crypto isn't treated as this. So therefore, the wash sale rule does not apply. And when the wash sale rule doesn't apply, you have tons of flexibility and liquidity to do whatever the hell you want. AKA the crypto market is very unregulated at this point in time and why it's gonna be regulated pretty soon. But crypto, the crypto hack piece of this is huge because what, what you can do, let's say in this situation down here when John decides to sell his $21,000 or $21,000 and take the $4,000 loss. If he wanted to, what he could do is flip the equation really fast on the tech. He could lock in this loss of $4,000 at $21,000 and then what he could do is rebuy, theoretically if it was crypto, Apple stock again at $21,000. That's huge. Because basically you just lock in a loss, you take advantage of this, you aren't really even kicking the can down the road because you just rebuy at 21,000, same price that you bought in, the cost basis remains the same essentially, you've sold or you locked in the loss and you hold the same asset right away. The only thing you wanna watch out for is for fees of trading fees, if you're, if you're dealing with any trading fees, but if it's a significant portion, it makes a lot of sense to lock that in. I've done that this year. I have done that already this year. I sold my crypto, I rebought it right away, and I went ahead and took advantage of um, tax loss harvesting on an unregulated asset per se at this point in time. Um, I know a lot of professionals that are doing this as well. It makes all the sense in the world. It's not gonna be around long. They've already talked about it being gone last year. I'm surprised it's still around, but that's an opportunity, guys. The crypto hack could save you tons of money. If you guys have thousands of dollars locked up in crypto right now and your $25,000 loss of losses in there, you're not changing your strategy, you're not changing your investments, you're just clicking two buttons back and forth to take advantage of this, this loophole per se in the tax game and then you're gonna win big time long term, whether crypto even you know becomes a thing or not. So um, that's a really good hack, guys. I highly recommend to look into that and educate yourself on that if you haven't done already because that could save you a ton of money. Um, and other than that, guys, I hope that lesson helped you guys tonight with tax loss harvesting. Uh, comment questions, obviously, I'll answer questions in just a second. Uh, but comment topics that you guys want me to cover on Whiteboard Wednesday because my goal is to answer anything and everything that you guys uh, have questions on. All right.